take your um, LLM. So I've got a short presentation uh, about one of the topics that I specialize in, uh, and you'll see here from my profile, I'm a specialist in the topic of private international law. Uh, I sort of write for the, uh, the main textbooks in England and Wales, Dicey Morrison Collins on the conflict of laws, and also the main Scottish uh, textbook on the subject, uh, Anton's private international law. So what I'm going to do today is to talk to you about one of the core building blocks of private international law. Uh, it's a topic that I have just been um, teaching uh, over the last few weeks with one of my LLM groups. Uh, and so that will give you a flavor as to what you can expect if you come uh, next academic year. So before that, some reminders of, of, of why you might want to consider coming to Scotland and coming to the University of Dundee to undertake your, your master's program. Obviously at Dundee, we're a, a very highly ranked university, top 20 in the UK in the latest Guardian League table. And Dundee Law School is of course even better ranked in the top 15 of all three main league tables for law schools in the United Kingdom. Now, one of the things I'm most proud of with regard to Dundee Law School and indeed the University of Dundee as a whole is the fact that we really put students at the forefront of everything that we do. We're a small university, we're a relatively small law school, so we're able to give lots of individual attention and support to all of our students. We really recognize the huge investment that you make in coming to study in the UK, and we really want to make sure that you fulfill your potential. So next academic year, we're really confident because of the great success of the vaccine program uh, that we'll have lots of uh, small group teaching. And of course, teaching on the LLM is primarily small group seminars of 20 to 30 students. Um, so we hope that although there will be social distancing, um, that we'll be able to have lots and lots of face to face teaching ne next academic year. Of course, another great feature of Dundee Law School and the university is that we're a campus institution and the campus is in the heart of our dynamic city. We also have lots of very generous scholarships. And if you do want to find out more about our scholarships, uh, do reach out to Amy who's on this call or WhatsApp me and you'll find my WhatsApp number at the end of this presentation. So the topic I'm going to explore today is about connecting factors. Connecting factors are the core building block of private international law. For those of you who have studied private international law before, you'll know that it's comprised of three main elements. The first is jurisdiction. When should a court, or when is a court able to hear a case uh, in which there's an international element? Secondly, if a court does have jurisdiction to hear a case with an international element, what law is it going to apply to the substantive issues in that case. And then thirdly, uh, the rules on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. So when it comes to trying to work out when a court should have jurisdiction, or indeed as to what law should be applied to the substantive uh, elements of the case, to, to, to do that, uh, legal systems around the world use these tools called connecting factors. Connecting factors are a way of linking a person to a legal system or a person to a legal territory, or indeed a dispute to a legal system or dispute to a legal territory. So what I'm going to talk about today is one of the most important contemporary uh, connecting factors, that of habitual residence. It has become the, the most popular way of linking people to places and people to laws. Um, so first of all, in the first slides, uh, I'm going to give you a flavor of what we include in our course handouts. Now, for every LLM program at the University of Dundee, every, every uh, individual module, uh, module um, there is a course handout. And within that course handout, there's a general explanation of the, uh, of the subject. And then for each individual topic, there is a reading list, set of explanations, and a set of questions. So here in the forthcoming slides, I've basically lifted out uh, some of the elements that were in seminar five that I did a couple of weeks ago on personal connecting factors. So we'll just run through this quickly. Uh, you don't need to read everything in, in detail, but I simply want to give you a flavor of what you can expect when you come to the University of Dundee and Dundee Law School. So I begin, I've got several slides where I seek to introduce the topic of personal connecting factors. Now, one of the key things I should point out at this stage is that when you come to a leading law school uh, like Dundee Law School, 
um, you're investing not just in an education to learn about the law, to be able to repeat what the law is. What you're investing in is the ability to develop key skills. And one of the most important skills is the ability to analyze. We're not just looking for students to be able to parrot off specific rules or specific cases. We are seeking to help our students develop into really, really strong legal analysts. Because when you want to sort of go on and succeed in your legal career, it's not enough to be able to say, I know what the law is in state X, I know what law Y is. What you need to be able to do to be a successful lawyer, to have a successful career, is to be able to give lots of really good strategic advice to your clients. And that is really something that we seek to tease out uh, in the, the, the Dundee Law School LLM programs. And it's certainly something that I do in my modules on private international law. So you can see uh, in the, uh, the introduction to this seminar, seminar number five on personal connecting factors, I start by asking a series of questions and I seek to build up the complexity of those questions. So this is sowing seeds in the minds of my students as to what are the issues that they need to reflect upon as they do the core reading. So I already talked about the, uh, the core building blocks of private international law. So my first question to my students is, 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 how should a person be connected to a place for the purpose of determining whether jurisdiction exists in a matter of personal status? And then I note that given that we live very, very mobile lives, or at least we did until COVID came along, um, should short, should long-term connections be prioritized in order to favor stability of connection? Or rather, should regard be paid to a person's current home, even if the length of connection to that place is not great? That seems a bit of a long question, but really it gets to the heart of one of the main challenges surrounding connecting factors. So when we're trying to link a person to a place, do we look at that from a very broad long-term perspective, or do we take a very narrow perspective? And there are advantages and disadvantages to both positions. And that's something that we look at uh, as we go through the, the case law, the literature, uh, and indeed as we have our discussions in class, because all uh, LLM teaching at Dundee Law School is based on seminars, it's based on discussion, it's based on the exchange of views. You can't be a shrinking violet when you come here. Uh, we will ask you lots of questions. We want to challenge you. We want to help you develop as great legal analysts. So you can see the next question I say, um, can or should there be some accommodation between short or long-term connections and the allocation of jurisdiction? Another sort of probing question I ask my students, to what extent should party autonomy have a role to play in identifying the way in which a person is linked to a place or linked to a legal system. Lots more questions that come up. And again, questions and background to help my students really understand what the core issues are, because this is the, the sort of the self-directed approach to learning that we adopt. We, give, we, we, we challenge the students, they've got the reading to do, we seek to focus that reading, we seek to focus the way in which they engage with the reading, whether it's literature, whether it, 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 it's cases, and then we come back into the seminar and we discuss these really, really important issues. So I flag up the specific case of children um, because that's a, specific, a, a real complexity when it comes to identifying uh, the way in which connections are made. And then I sort of ask my students to consider the underlying purpose uh, of the jurisdiction rules um, and whether uh, connection for the purpose of jurisdiction should be the same as connection for the purpose of choice of law. Then uh, in, in, in my handout, I give a bit of background about the way in which uh, <clears throat> states over the years have, have engaged with this issue of, of connection. So that helps them uh, understand some of that. Talking about the, the differences between common law and civil law jurisdictions common law jurisdictions traditionally using the, the Roman law doctrine of domicile, whereas civil law jurisdictions favored the, the, uh, the 19th century concept of nationality. And this again reflects what we seek to do at Dundee Law School. It's not just telling you what the law is in a particular legal system. We want, we try to encourage and foster a comparative approach. And a question I'm often asked is, if I come to Dundee, it's in Scotland, Am I just going to learn from the perspective of Scottish law? Well, absolutely not. 
So Dundee, we're not just a Scottish law school, we're a law school in Scotland where Scottish law is taught to undergraduates, but also English law has always been taught to undergraduates. We have a really diverse international law faculty and all of our uh, LLM programs are comparative and international in focus. So you won't be learning a sort of domestic British approach to your area of law, whether it's commercial law, corporate law, business and human rights, environmental law. It really very much is an international focus. And we try to encourage that uh, through the discussions that we have and through the readings that we, we select uh, on our seminar guide. So, um, I've got more information, uh, more challenges for the students explaining how the habitual residence concept has, has led to lots of uncertainty over the last years. Uh, and then we give information about that, the topics we're gonna cover, and then explaining how Brexit has impacted on the interpretation of this concept. So then just to give you a flavor, I sort of list some of the reading that, that people should uh, understand and, and get to grips with. You can see the pages there. Um, often people say, oh my goodness, lots and lots of reading. So we do star things that we consider uh, to be the most important. So you can see a little star next to Cheshire North and Fawcett's uh, book, uh, and then some additional articles people can look at, and then a selection of cases. For some topics, uh, there's lots and lots of secondary literature and not much in terms of cases, but for other topics like habitual residence, which is very case law heavy, there are quite a few cases to look at. And you can see that some are starred uh, and some are not. Obviously, that the students who've got the most time, who are most motiv motivated, will look at all the cases. But if you've less time, you'll just look at those cases that are stars. So, in the handout, you have the introduction, you have the, uh, the scene setting, then you have the reading list, and then you have the core questions, the questions that, that will form the key elements of the discussions in class. So you can see here, I have a list of, uh, list of, of different questions uh, that I want my students to, to, to look at so that they can really get to grips with this key doctrine, key concept of habitual residence, the key way in which people are linked to a legal territory for the purposes of jurisdiction, and increasingly are linked to a, a legal system, a, a set of laws for the purposes of choice of law. So then I go on to my, to my presentation. Uh, this is a presentation that I do actually include uh, alongside the questions, so the students can consider this in advance. It's not something that we go through in class because the class is all about discussion. It's about answering questions that people might have from looking at the presentation, from looking at the, uh, the different topics, the different elements, sources on the reading list. Um, and so this helps students uh, get to grips very, very quickly with the, um, with the topic. So, first title of, the, of this slide is Habitual Residence Ubiquitous uh, Connecting Factor. And so I explain how it's become the, the connecting factor of choice for all contemporary international and EU family law instruments. Then I note the sort of the, uh, the other alternatives, obviously, as I mentioned before, nationality, domicile, uh, and party autonomy, each of which plays a subsidiary role. To really understand the challenges uh, surrounding habitual residence, I provide a little bit of historical and theoretical context. Um, so I go back to the views of different commentators from over 40, 50 years ago, because that's when habitual residence really began to come into vogue. So in understanding this concept, it's really important to, to appreciate how it actually became, uh, emerged as the most important connecting factor. So back 50 years ago, uh, there was a, a common view that, that we, we needed a solution in private international law to break away from uh, the, the common law, civil law divide between domicile and habitual residence, and also a connecting factor that was more adapted to the challenges presented by an ever uh, more mobile society. And many commentators, so we've got Winter here, uh, uh, my former supervisor, Professor Anton, we'll see in the subsequent slide, they all believed this concept of habitual residence was a wonderful solution because it was portrayed as being factual, it was portrayed as being simple, it was portrayed as being straightforward, and therefore was, was almost a form of panacea to, 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 to overcome challenges from domicile and, uh, and uh, nationality. 
and would be a straightforward way to link people to a particular legal territory or a particular legal system. So De Winter, in his seminar article, stated that habitual residents had the advantage that the courts have the latitude to decide on the basis of all the factual data and on the basis of common sense whether or not a person has his habitual residence in a certain country. So Professor Anto, my former supervisor, uh, whose book on, uh, on private international and our rights, uh, he stated the habitual nature of residence was regarded simply as a question of fact, making definition otios. Uh, OTOs meaning uh, sort of unnecessary. Havers, a professor from Harvard, uh, said that since habitual residence does not come to us with nearly two centuries of definitional disputation, the use of the term in lieu of domicile may make it easier for courts on appeal and in recognition cases to encourage the concept's common sense application. So we've got these sort of leading commentators from 50 years ago who were all so positive uh, about this connecting fact. Uh, and I think that this, this, um, this, the, this quote from Cavers is particularly telling. Um, Since habitual residence does not come to us with nearly two centuries of definitional disputation, uh, it may make it easier for courts to encourage the concept common sense application. Well, without doubt, it did not have at uh, two centuries of definitional disputation back in 1972 when Professor Cabers wrote that. However, uh, unfortunately, over the course of the last 50 years, particularly over the course of the last decade, um, there has been an absolute explosion in case law surrounding habitual residence. And I'm not just talking about uh, trial judgments or appeal judgments, I'm talking about Supreme Court judgments all around the world. It's incredible that very, very few uh, family cases ever get to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, um, but there has been an avalanche of cases on habitual residence in recent years. Uh, and the reason for this is that habitual residence has, has not turned out to be the simple concept that everybody thought it might be. If someone lives in a country and rarely if ever moves, then it's going to be perfectly simple and straightforward to work out where he or she is habitually resident. But because people move very frequently, uh, might spend a year here, two years there, it becomes very, very difficult to work out which place, if any, is their place of habitual residence. And this goes back to the comment I made at the very beginning. From what perspective should one uh, frame this form of connecting people? Short term, a medium term, or a long term? And also, uh, courts have struggled with the context in which habitual residence has been used. So often, uh, habitual residence is interpreted to achieve particular outcomes in specific cases. And this may achieve justice in the individual case, but ultimately creates lots of problems with regard to the evolution and interpretation of the concept, particularly in common law jurisdictions where the doctrine of precedent uh, has such importance. We've got this great quote um, about why um, there had been such optimism. It's, it, it, it's a case, a, a seminal case from California, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, Moses and Moses. It was a case that involved uh, a child abduction case, a case where a, a mother took her children from Israel to, to California for a sabbatical for a year. Uh, and then after the expiry of the year, year long period, um, she decided she wasn't going, wasn't going to return to Israel with the children. And the issue that had to be determined was after the children had spent so long in California, where were they habitually resident? The agreement of the parents had been that they were to go for a year and then go back to Israel. But ultimately, the mother uh, reneged from that agreement and said, no, nope, we're staying. So the court had to determine at that moment in time, where were the children habitually resident? So the quote from, from the judge who became Chief Justice Kaczynski, subsequently, he said, just as hard cases make bad law, easy cases can make for overly broad law, particularly when unqualified statements come to be applied outside of the factual context that inspired them. I could not agree more. That, that really has, has, is such a trend in cases on habitual residence. The reason I particularly like this quote is the incredible irony in it. Why, why, do, you, why do I say it's ironic? 
Um, because unfortunately, Justice Kaczynski went on to do what he had specifically complained of in that quote. So he himself, he looked to an English court, uh, a judgment of the House of Lords, ex parte Shah, and he relied on that to come to, uh, to influence his interpretation on habitual residence. And in doing so, he completely and utterly ignored the factual context in which the judgment in ex parte Shah was made. So yes, he was correct in, 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 in making the statement, but unfortunately he himself did not apply it. Now, in terms of why and how habitual residence became the primary connecting factor in global private international law, well, as I explained before, it's because there was such dissatisfaction with the traditional fact connecting factors of domicile and of, of nationality. And also to bridge this gap between uh, the common law and civil law divide. But the problem was, um, stemming on from the, the, the positive comments of the leading professors of Cavers, of Anton, of, of, of uh, the Winter, the world 50 years ago is very different to the world today, or at least the world pre-COVID, um, and that the level of mobility that those professors could have anticipated, that anybody could have anticipated 50 years ago, was a long way short of the level of mobility that exists today. Nevertheless, um, habitual residence has remained the key connecting factor. Its, its evolution has been driven by several uh, international family law instruments, the most important of which is the 1980 Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. And after a few years of its application in, in this convention, people began to say, well, maybe there are some problems, but nevertheless, uh, it was still pushed forward and became embedded as the connecting factor of choice in, in private international law. The problem with the last 10 years in particular is that different uh, interpretations of the concept have emerged. And that's one of the things that we seek to tease out uh, in, in our seminars. Whenever there is this divergence in the way in which concepts, in the way in which legal principles uh, apply and, and, and operate in different legal systems, we really try and get our students to understand those. Because success on the LLM is all based on analysis. It's about comparing and contrasting. It's about looking for the strengths, it's about looking for the weaknesses. It's about coming up with your own assessment in the light of the evidence as to what is the most appropriate way for a particular legal topic, a particular e legal issue, to be addressed. And uh, certainly habitual residence provides lots and lots of fruitful opportunities to be able to engage in that level of analysis. So again, I ask lots and lots of questions because it's all about challenging students, not simply telling a story, not simply having dry legal text to read. We want you to think, we want you to develop as critical lawyers. So some of the questions I'm asking uh, during this, uh, during the, the presentation that the students have to read before the class is um, thinking about the, the challenges inherent in habitual residence. So does it represent a status? Should people have a single habitual residence for all purposes? Or does it really depend on the context in which it's used? So if habitual residence is used in the context of divorce jurisdiction, should it be interpreted one way? Or if it's used in the context of, of child custody proceedings, should it be applied in a, in a different way? Certainly within the European Union, the Court of Justice of the European Union has an approach to habitual residence for adults, and it has a quite different approach to habitual residence for children. Now, just one thing that, that I want you to, to, to think about is a takeaway, even if you've no real interest in, in um, private international or indeed on, on connecting factors. It's always said that habitual residence is, is, or traditionally been said that habitual residence is a factual concept. And this is one thing that I really want my students to think about, to really unpick the veracity of statements. Don't just accept things at face value. You must challenge them. So I ask the question here, can there be a connecting factor which is truly factual? Um, so I look at the different types of connecting factor that can exist. So presence, so everybody can understand the idea of presence. Either you're present in a place or you're not. But I would say that clearly is, is a purely factual way of linking people to a place. But then if you move beyond presence and you think of residence. So once you think of residence, that's 
connoting a, a, an additional quality to the presence that might exist. Um, and then once that I'm characterizing that quality, I would say that that calls into question whether the residence can be truly factual. And then once you add habitual to residence, then I would say that that uh, is clearly habitual residence is no longer a matter of pure fact. The most basic level, there needs to be some understanding, as I've said before, as to the parameters of the habit. Should it be ascertained over a short term, a medium term, or a long term perspective? And again, to what extent should this classification be influenced by the legislative context in which habitual residence is used? So I'm not going to say much, much more. So that's giving you a flavor of the way in which we approach our teaching at Dundee Law School. Uh, lots and lots of questions. We want you to really think. We want you to develop as lawyers. We help you to, to develop lots of key transferable skills. Obviously, research is very important. You need to be able to identify the core materials that we've listed in our reading list. We also want you to try and uncover additional materials, and you'll get lots of credit for that if you come up with additional sources in your, in your uh, uh, assignments. But also, most importantly, it's been able to be effective, critical lawyers, lawyers who be able to give really, really valuable strategic advice to your clients. That is the value of doing an LLM at Dundee Law School. So here again, a list of our key programs. So Business and Human Rights, that's the, uh, our fantastic new program. Uh, environmental Law, where we have lots and lots of research expertise at Dundee University. Uh, and then our most popular programs of Corporate and Commercial Law and International Commercial Law. And always remember that if you do International Commercial Law or if you do Private International Law, you can spend a semester at one of our partner institutions in France and get two awards, the LLM from Dundee and the Master Two degree from, from Sergi Paris, if you do International Commercial Law, or, or Toulouse, if you do Private International Law. So remember the fees, there's 19,000 pounds, you can pay in seven installments, uh, and again, our very generous scholarship packages of up to 5,000 pounds. So uh, do reach out to Amy if you'd like to sort of be uh, considered for one of our uh, global, citizenship, global citizenship scholarships. Uh, we're very happy to answer any questions and we can organize an interview for you. Um, and here are my details as well. So Prof Peter, that's my email and that's my WhatsApp number. So thank you all very, very much for coming to join this afternoon. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, or indeed ask questions to, to Amy. Thank you, Peter. We have had a question come in, in which I said that we could answer live. And that question is, apart from becoming a solicitor or a barrister, can LLM graduates seek a job in different sectors, such as banking or other international organizations? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, many of our graduates, many of our uh, students um, have done their law degrees in, in, in foreign countries. They will often have experience either working as lawyers or working in, in companies or in banks. And they use the LLM to give them those extra skills and to then to get promotion once they return back home. So what we, we have students who, who go back to, to, to the commercial context, who, who go back to banks, and also who go back to law firms or indeed change, upgrade uh, the, 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 uh, the position that they might have. Great, thank you, Peter. And we don't have many questions coming in, but I would just like to say a couple of words um, just to our offer holders today. A quick reminder um, that you do have support and guidance from your international engagement team. So I can recognize some names today and it's great that you've been able to attend in live time. Your engagement officer will send you the recording of this Caster lecture afterwards. So any questions, any concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to your engagement officer, whether that is through email, through WhatsApp, whatever communication method works best for you. And I would just like to let you all know that the engagement team are delivering a drop-in question and answer session. That will be on Wednesday the 7th of April, and that will be starting at quarter past four UK time. So that's quarter past four in the afternoon. It will be very relaxed, so feel free to come along, ask us anything, and we will try our very best to answer your questions. We are also in the process of planning a Living in Dundee presentation. So we know that you will be thinking of your next steps and accommodation will be one of those important next steps. So we are planning that. And as soon as those informations have been confirmed, we will send you an email with the full details. 
And just lastly from me, I would like to remind you, if you are an offer holder, um, if you've not already, join the International Offer Holder Facebook group. It's a great way to meet others who will be studying within our law school, but across a wider range of programmes as well. So it's a really great way to connect with others across the globe and meet friends before you do start your studies. So Peter, I will let you say some final words. Um, would you like to remind everyone of the next session that we are holding, which is the Law Career Session? Yeah, thanks very much, Amy. Yes, so the, 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 the third element of, of, of these uh, webinars is we're going to have a career session. Uh, and it's, I'm really, really excited. I'll be meeting sort of two uh, alumni who'll be able to tell us a bit about how the, the University of Dundee LLM helped them in their future careers. Um, so that's going to be really, really exciting because you're investing in the University of Dundee LLM really to, to, to increase your legal expertise, to increase your legal skills. And we really, really are do everything we can to make sure that our students then uh, sort of take great leaps forward in the future careers. So we've got several examples of, of alumni who'll be coming to, 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 to join us for a discussion. I'm really looking forward to, to asking lots of questions uh, and please do come and join us for that session and you can see the value of the University of Dundee LLM. Again, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out by email or by WhatsApp. We're very, very friendly, very approachable uh, and uh, I look forward to engaging with you and hopefully having some of you in my private international class uh, next semester or indeed in, in 12 months time. So thank you all very much for, for joining uh, and I look forward to, to seeing you all and connecting with you over the coming weeks and months. Thank you everyone.